G'day there. You're watching the Aussie BIM Guru, and today I've got a really quick tutorial which is going to show you how to move rooms from Revit into Rhino uh, using Rhino inside Revit. The main reason I usually do this is for things like ladybug solar analysis studies, and I've built up quite a reliable, robust workflow, which should work for most models out there, and is much more reliable than constantly calling on room geometry. So if you haven't already checked out my other tutorials on Rhino Inside, feel free to do so. There's a playlist on the channel for them. Otherwise, we're gonna dive straight in. Um, I'll be using Revit 2020, and I'll be using Rhino 7 with Rhino Inside. Anyway, let's get started. So I'm currently in a Revit model, and it's important to note that I've made sure that my rooms and areas in the area and volume computations are set to areas only. I really just want these rooms to be a simple shape. I don't want them to have any sort of vertical or non-linear uh, articulations because we're going to basically run an intersection through the middle of them in order to find the room's boundary. So under add-ins, I'm just going to go to Rhino 7 and I'm going to boot up Rhino inside Revit. And then I'm also going to boot up Grasshopper in Rhino in Revit. So if you're not familiar with that step, definitely go and check out my other series on Rhino Inside on my channel, where I'll show you more of those details. Anyway, uh, most of what I'm going to do here is actually going to be related to Rhino. So I'm going to just flip over in this case and focus mostly on the Rhino preview geometry. So we're going to begin by collecting the rooms category. Now, instead of using a model categories picker, I'm just going to query the category. And I'm going to query the category of rooms. And in this case, this is a much more direct and reliable way to call on one category. So in this case, it doesn't give the user the option to pick a category. It just limits it to the one that we care about. I use this in workflows like this, where you only want one category or a very specific input. So from here, we're going to build a category filter. And I'm also going to query the elements in my Revit model. And I'm going to get their geometry as well. So I'm going to use the element geometry node, and there we go. Now we should have a preview of the rooms in our model. So that's a good start. And in this case, note that there's no sort of vertical roof bows or articulation, because we're just looking at the areas, not the volumes. So really important. Otherwise, the workflow typically just won't work if you do that. So now that we've got our geometry, we can start processing it and, and find the actual outline of our room. Now, there's lots of ways you can do this. Um, one of them is to try and pick the faces of the B-reps. I find that can be a little bit unreliable depending on the shapes of the B-reps and how many elements are contained in them. So what I sometimes like to do is get a bounding box around them first. So I'll take my geometry and I'll bound it. And in this case, note that we are gonna get, uh, I think it's gonna be 30 closed B-reps. So in this case, we can probably just flatten this list. Yeah, we can just flatten this list. And we should still have 30 items. Yep. So in this case, we're gonna take these bounding boxes and we're gonna assess a few things about them. We're gonna take their volume and that will give us the centroid in the middle of the bounding box. We're gonna use that to cast a plane through each of them and then push the intersection down to the bottom of the bounding box. So if, to do this, we need to know the height of the bounding box as well. So I'm gonna use a deconstruct box node in this case. So I'm gonna take that and I'm gonna to have to deconstruct the Z domain, Z domain. And that will give us the start and the end or the highest and the lowest Z value in the bounding boxes points. And I'm gonna subtract the start from the end. Now you're probably wondering why I'm not doing the end from the start. In this case, I'm gonna get a negative value because I'm checking them essentially the wrong way around. I'm checking them bottom to top. So what I'm gonna do with this is keep it negative so I can push this down, but I'm gonna push it down by half of the height. So the centroid needs to go down by half of the height. So I'm going to divide that by two as well. And I'm going to use this to construct a Z vector. We're going to keep this for later. And now we've got our, our centroid. So we're going to do a BRAP plane intersection uh, in this case, I believe. Yep. And we're going to take our rooms geometry, not the bounding boxes. And we're going to take those centroids. And with these, we should now get an intersection. So I'm just going to go back and turn off a few previews intersection between the B-reps and the centroids or the planes defined at those centroids. Now it's really important to note that some of these elements might have more than one curve. For example, the, the dining room has a column in it. So in this case, if I check what I'm getting in the curves, I'm gonna find that some of my lists might have more than one curve. And this is a problem. This workflow doesn't really work for rooms that are donutting other rooms or rooms that have donut shapes in them like a column or something like that. So in this case, what I'm going to do is only take the largest possible closed curve for the room. So I'm going to get, uh, probably in this case, there's a few ways I could do this. I'm actually going to assess the area 
of these curves. I'm going to take the curves and find their area. Now this is going to give me the center point of each of them as well. I don't really care about that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to sort my lists and the key is going to be the areas and the things I'm sorting are going to be the curves. So in this case, I should find that I'm going to get uh, the lowest items first and the highest items last. So I can see here that this area is smaller and this is larger, which means I've collected that little column circle and then the wider boundary. So I'm going to take the last item from every list. So I'm going to call on list item and from each of those curves, I'm going to index at negative one, oh, sorry, negative one, which means the last item in uh, grasshopper terms. And now we should just have one curve for each list. So I'll just turn off some of those previews and that removes that column and any other potential curves in future that might come and interfere with the script. Now I can take these curves and I can move them. So I'm going to move them down by half of the height of the bounding box from the centroid. Now we took the plane at the centroid, so I can take these curves and move them down by this vector. Now if I go back and just have a look at the room's geometry originally, and I have a look at these, we can see we've now got the bottom of each room at the base of the room that it was taken from. So a nice quick little workflow. So I'm gonna go back and turn these off. And we can now proceed with these as surfaces. So I'm just gonna turn these into B reps. And there we go. So now we have a B rep for each room in our model. Now I could bake them in as they are, but what I'm gonna do is bake them in with some data using the Elefront package. So in this case, I need to draw some data out of my rooms. So I'm gonna get a relay node, just so I can take my elements and sort of get them out of the way on the canvas down here. Now I'm going to use an element, get element parameter node, and I could go and get a list of values. But one problem I found is if you go to get a room's area, Rhino seems to convert it if it's in a list of parameters. If it's on its own, it seems to understand the Revit area natively. Um, I can try to demonstrate this. So what I'll do is create a panel and I'll make it multi-line. And let's say name number ID and area. And these are the keys that we're extracting. We're grafting them onto each element to get one value per element. Now let's go have a look at these values in a panel. Well, look at the area. It's very strange. 2.2707 e to the power of seven, scientific raised seven. It doesn't really make any sense. Um, if I just get the area on its own and I just don't graft it, we should should hopefully see something a little bit more rational. And there we go. If you just get area on its own outside a multi-line panel, it gives you the proper area. Now, I don't understand why that happens. Very strange. It seems like it's converting the data into a format that's workable um, in a list or tree format. I assume the trees can only support certain types of data at once. That's, that's my best guess. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get these all one by one instead. So it's not necessarily computationally efficient. Um, but it's computationally necessary in this case, if that makes sense. A little bit of a funny part in this workflow that th throws a lot of people off when they first come across it. And I'm going to get also the elements ID. So we have four, four parameters. Now I'm going to use a merge node in two aspects. First of all, I'm going to collect each parameter's name in a list. Whoops. And these are going to be the keys that we assign our parameter data to. So I'm just going to put this here and I'm going to create another merge node. I'm going to take each list of values. And these are going to be the values that we assign to the keys when we assign data to our rooms. Now, this isn't going to quite come out in the format that we want it to. It's going to come out just sitting at one level. So I'm going to graft every list onto itself. And this will basically create sub lists or branches that contain the four values. So in this case, the data is structured so that it's parallel to the keys for each element. And we're gonna take advantage of this. I'm also gonna define a new layer. So using the Elefront package, uh, in this case, I believe it's this one, we're gonna define, define a layer. So I think that's here. And the layer's name is gonna be rooms. So I'm just gonna go back to the start and grab rooms. And we can just get a swatch node for the color. I'm just gonna make them white by default. And now we have a layer. And finally, we're gonna construct some Elefront attributes. So I'm gonna define object attributes. So I'm gonna take my keys, which are my four parameter names. I'm gonna take, in this case, uh, my values. I'm gonna take my names, which are gonna be my IDs, which I'll take from this list, and my layer. Now, right now, it's not quite coming out in the right order. 
we need to graft it at the element's name. So when, if we graph this, the keys and the values will be applied to those respective elements at the same level as those branches. And now we end up with 30 attributes that we can flatten into a list. And finally, we can use this to bake the objects. So I'm gonna take my vreps, my attributes, and I'll take my bake name so I can rebake the rooms again if I need to. And I'm just gonna use the bake name of rooms. So this is actually being used a few times. And finally, I'm gonna get a button to bake the rooms. And usually I just call this uh, bake. So once I hit play or bake, this should bake the rooms into my Rhino model. And let's just have a quick look at one of them. So if we go to its properties, we can see its name is its element ID. And if we go to its Elephant properties, we can see the area, the bake name, the ID, uh, the name and the number have all come across successfully. Now that the area is looking a little bit funny still. I'll just double check that. It seems okay over here. It just seems once um once the area comes into one of these lists, it's not quite right. So that's a little bit odd. Um, we can always try to convert this to a number maybe. I'll see what happens if I feed this into a number node. Interesting, that seems to be where it gets tripped up. So I'm, I'm wondering if maybe there's some unit conversion happening here possibly. Uh, between the area at that stage. Um, I'm just seeing if there's any other options I have for how I can call on that data. Hmm, strange. Um, I can try dividing it by one maybe. Let's see what I get. No, it's always going into some sort of scientific format. Very interesting. Um, I do have units in my model set to millimeters. So I'm wondering if maybe that's something to do with it. Maybe if I divide this by, maybe by 1000 twice. So 1,000, 1,000, so a million. I'm wondering if maybe that gives me square meters. Okay, so it's a, it's a rounding issue um, in the format. So what I can do now instead is I guess I can just divide that by by 1,000. It's a shame I don't have an expression available there. I, can, I can't express it there either. What I'll need to do is probably uh, divide it first. Yep, so if I do that, what I'll do is I'll disconnect this and I'll shift control, sorry, shift select. Is it shift control? Hmm, can't seem to quite disconnect the nodes the way I want to. Okay, what I'm gonna do instead is just gonna connect the value here to the list there. Ah, because I only have one thing connected so I couldn't disconnect more than one thing. Okay, and now this should at least uh, bake in our elements. Now, because we're using a bake name, if things move around and I just bake again, it should update this and now it looks like the areas are working. So in this case, we just have to account for that difference in units. So in this case, square meters uh, versus uh, square millimeters. But it looks like everything else is baked across. And with these rooms, we can now undertake a more detailed analysis in Rhino without relying on that live Revit link to be present for the whole time. So there we go. Um, we've seen how we can process uh, room geometry into Rhino um, using Rhino inside. In the next part, we're gonna be looking at how to simplify these rooms into samples, essentially reconstructing them into meshes that can be more easily received by something like Ladybug. And after this, I'll show you how you can use this to generate a solar study and then send these results back to the same Revit model that we took the rooms from originally. So pretty exciting. Anyway, if you're not already following and subscribing, uh, feel free to do so, and I look forward to seeing you in future videos. Thanks, take care, bye.